During this holiday season, I would like to take a minute to thank all of our listeners and guests for making this past year so special. Thanks to your continued support of the Deadhead Cannabis Show podcast and our advertisers, we can keep doing our part to normalize cannabis by sharing the uncensored truth with the world, along with some of the greatest music ever played. We are honored that you choose to spend time with us each week, and Rob, Dan, and I wish everyone a safe and healthy holiday season. Lift Events and Experiences, known for Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade shows, is hosting a full slate of events in 2023 and expanding to the U.S., and you're invited. Lift welcomes everyone from legacy participants to multi-state operators to everyday folks who enjoy and respect the plant. Join us in lifting the cannabis community together January 12th through the 14th in Vancouver, then Toronto in June, and San Francisco in August. Visit liftevents.com for details. That's liftevents.com. During this holiday season, I would like to take a minute to thank all of our listeners and guests for making this past year so special. Thanks to your continued support of the Deadhead Cannabis Show podcast and our advertisers, we can keep doing our part to normalize cannabis by sharing the uncensored truth with the world, along with some of the greatest music ever played. We are honored that you choose to spend time with us each week, and Rob, Dan, and I wish everyone a safe and healthy holiday season. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hi, I'm Gary, and I invite you to discover the Cannabis Podcast, a bi-weekly podcast focused on a Canadian's cannabis culture. I would be the Canadian, and my cannabis passion and culture has been building for five decades. I share that passion for this wonderful plant in every episode, through conversations with cannabis advocates and enthusiasts, stories about the ever-changing legal environment, and some hands-on testing of product in a segment I call Cultivar Corner. The Cannabis Podcast, a Canadian's cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Welcome to another episode of the Deadhead Cannabis Show. I'm Larry Michigan of Michigan Law in Chicago. I'm here with my co-hosts today, Jim Marty and Rob Hunt, who I will uh, stop and say hello to in a minute. Uh, If you are tuning in today, if it's your first time or you've been a longtime fan of the show, this is the one you do not want to miss. We are very, very honored to have as our guest today, uh, David Gans. Uh, David co-hosts Tales from the Golden Road with Gary Lambert on Sirius XM on Sunday afternoons. Uh, He wrote uh, a book called Playing in the Band, which if you haven't read a copy of it yet, uh, you don't really know as much about the dead as you think you do. Uh, He is a musician and does other lots of cool stuff. And we want to really maximize our opportunity here today to speak with David Gans. So let me quickly bring in my co-hosts and... uh, We're going to dive right in, and hopefully you will all find this to be as exciting and interesting as we do. Jim, uh, Jim Marty from Longmont, Colorado. How are you, sir? Very good. Yep. Got lots of things to talk about. We're very happy to have you. Uh, We love Tales from the Golden Road. Listened to it for many years. We got lots of great questions, and we want to give you a chance to expand. Uh, We also have with us uh, Rob Hunt out in, uh, I believe he's on the East Coast uh, at this point in time. Rob, how you doing? I'm great. I am on the East Coast. I've been uh, fishing for the last five days. It's been some of the best striper fishing I've had in years. Um, this morning was epic. Yesterday morning was epic. So no complaints and happy to uh, happy to be hanging out here, catching fish and uh, getting a chance to speak to David Gans. So this is lovely. Uh, can't wait to do it. Wonderful. Uh, well, David, uh, thank you so much for uh, taking time to be on the show. As we were saying to you at the beginning, uh, we know every Sunday you get to sit there and listen to stories from Grateful Dead fans, and today we want to you know, have the opportunity to hear your story. Uh, we all love your show. We love uh, what you and Gary bring to the table and giving the opportunity for all the deadheads uh, from all over to come in and tell their stories. Uh, I think that it's fair to say that 
you know, whether I've ever met any of them or not, whether I was present anywhere close to any of the stories they tell, they all seem familiar. Uh, and you all feel like you could have been present at, at, at any of them at any time. And I just like that. If I can't be at a show, at least I can listen to you guys in the Deadheads. So welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Uh, I'm, I, I, I cannot believe my amazing good luck at the gigs that I've gotten in this Grateful Dead world. And the Tales from the Golden Road is it's just insanely fun and we we get so much wonderful stuff and as you said it feels a lot of it feels familiar and it's like people that if you don't know that person you know somebody just like them and and it's also great to connect with all these thousands of people that we've shared spaces with over time you know it's like you can meet somebody in this culture and start comparing notes and realize you've been in the same venues you know we were all at the same shows and stuff like that so it's really kind of like a, a family picnic every sunday afternoon where you just have random people to schmooze with you know how did it how did this show come about how did you know you and gary pull this together what was the genesis behind it and in 2007 when grateful dead productions made their deal with sirius satellite radio they recommended that Sirius hire me to consult on the creation of the channel. So I went to work with them, and, you know, it was there. a lot of it was really simple. Of course, we have complete concerts three times a day, and we'll have a This Day in History feature and stuff. So we started, and then I spent a lot of time stuffing live concerts into the library at the first couple of months. And I think we went live in the fall of 2007. And in January 2008, they said, let's have a little, let's have a round table program. Let's have a discussion show, maybe like once a month. Well, we'll get a couple of experts in and pick a topic and do a, something in depth. So uh, we did our first one, I think it was in January 2008. And we invited Eric Christensen, who's a colleague and friend of Gary's and mine from out here in San Francisco, who had just done a documentary on the Trips Festival. And we had a great time and we talked with him and we opened the phones and we started getting calls and stuff. And our bosses all just went nuts. It was like, oh, this is great. Let's do this every week. <laughs> and Gary was the perfect guy to bring in. I mean, we've known each other since the mid 80s. We've worked together on broadcasts, um, you know, live broadcasts on KPFA over the years and stuff. And, and I and I knew I, I knew him and I knew he'd be a perfect uh, co-host for this. So really, we just... They thought it up, uh, and it sort of defined itself after that. We just throw the phones open. We invite guests in, but we very rarely do anything like trying to guide the discussion. Like, today we're only going to talk about this. That just doesn't seem to work with a loose crowd like this. So we just open the phones and see what happens. <laughs> and you never seem to have any trouble getting uh, your phone lines full. I have have occasionally had moments of dread where I thought the lines are going to dry up before the show ends, but it has never happened. We've come close, but it has never happened. <laughs> yes, I called in there one time from uh, New Orleans when a Grateful Dead show got postponed. Um, if you recall, probably don't recall, it was a few years ago. I, I don't remember the specific call, no. Yeah, no, is it a Dead & Company show got postponed. Ah. I forget exactly why. New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So this is really like a labor of love for you guys, isn't it? I mean, do you ever get bored going to work, or is it just another week of fun stories? I haven't been bored in 50 years. Fair enough. It's. I mean, I, I, labor of love implies that we're not getting paid for it, and of course we're getting paid for it. Not hugely, but we're getting paid for it. Um, I, everything that I've done in my adult life has been music-related pursuits. And uh, aside from moments of underemployment at various times, I've always had meaningful and music-related ways to make a living. And falling in with the Grateful Dead turned out to be a really amazing thing. I mean, I was a deadhead when I started be, uh, doing music journalism, and I spent 10 years as a mainstream music journalist, you know, doing stories on Fleetwood Mac and Rod Stewart and all that kind of stuff for but basically from 76 to 86. But I always had my favorite subject, the Grateful Dead. So I've always managed to make a living doing writing and photography and music making. And the Grateful Dead thing turned out to be particularly uh, welcoming to me, I guess, because I, 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 being a musician, I, I, I came to them as a journalist who I think had a, a better or a slightly different angle on the questions. And the musicians recognized that I was asking them musical questions. 
And so they were more uh, responsive and welcoming to me. And I got basically formed friendships with Phil Lesh and Bob Weir, who helped me and supported me and advanced me and, and uh, you know, urged me to develop. You know, the, the Grateful Dead Hour was an accident, too. I was a journalist. I met Peter Simon. He invited me to um, do the text for his photo book of the Grateful Dead playing in the band, which came out in 1985. I went to a local radio station, KFOG, to promote the book, wound up producing a little documentary feature about the song Greatest Story Ever Told, and joined a small group of people that were contributing material to the, to the local, the KFOG Deadhead Hour. And then the management of the station realized that here I was, a bona fide expert on the subject with a book in print and stuff, so they asked me to take responsibility for the show because the guy that had been doing it was incredibly overworked. He was the morning drive DJ and he had his own Sunday night specialty show as well. So I, I happily took it over and then radio stations started calling and asking if they could have the show too. So without ever making any plan whatsoever, I didn't plan, I didn't start the show I didn't scheme to take over the show. I was invited to take over the show. And then the rest of the country started asking if they could carry the show. So I just literally just followed my nose into a career as a syndicated radio host. And all the rest of it, you know, other books, I, I was uh, uh, invited to publish a book on my interviews in 1991 uh, called Conversations with the Dead. And it's just it's just been like that ever since. I, I've managed to do dead related stuff and and uh, and and my own music for a living for the last 50 years it's, it's been a wonderful life so David that's a great segue for me to ask you know when did you first start listening to the dead who turned you on and what was your first show uh, my first show was March 5th 1972 I had I was living in San Jose California and I was uh, living in an apartment and writing songs with a high school classmate a gentleman named Stephen Donnelly and he started touting the Grateful Dead to me. And I didn't think I was going to like the Grateful Dead because I looked at their records and they had a song called Ripple. And I thought, oh, a song about cheap wine. That's no fun. And then they had a song called New Speedway Boogie. And I didn't think I was particularly a fan of Boogie. And then they had a lot of songs with blues in the title. And I wasn't really a blues fan. I was kind of into the L.A. folk rockers, right? Like Crosby, Stills and Nash. And I was into the Beatles and Jackson Brown and all that. So imagine my surprise when I took a heroic dose of acid and went to Winterland on March 5th of 72 and got my brain ripped open by all those amazing songs. So I was a goner immediately. They, I went home and started buying the records and listening to them. And, and then when the dead came back and played again in, uh, in the summer of 72, we went to four shows in five days. But it just it completely revolution, revolutionized my appreciation of how music works and what you can do with music. I became an improvisational musician in the wake of learning how the Grateful Dead's music works. And I found a bunch of guys in Berkeley that I could have conversational jams with. And so that's, you know, I've been doing it. I, I always wrote songs and I have, have been writing songs since 1969. But I started playing more in this Grateful Dead mode of being very eclectic and open-minded and, and loving songs from all kinds of sources and then stringing them together with improvisation. My, my, my explanation of what the Grateful Dead do that is unique is that they give equal weight to composition, interpretation, and improvisation. So they treat cover songs like Morning Dew and stuff like that. They make them their own, right? So you think of it as being part of the Grateful Dead's repertoire, even though it came from somewhere else. So they give equal weight to their own songs and the songs they brought from other people, and they jam to link them all up. And that's a very different way of making music and presenting music than the usual concert thing where the band comes out with it, you know, two big hits and a bunch of high energy set, and they play one quiet song in the middle, you know, that the audience patiently puts up with, and then they go back to a big blasting end, right? That's the sort of textbook contour of a Western rock concert in our era. Well, the Grateful Dead said, fuck that. We're going to do 10 ballads tonight. We're going to have a rocker at the beginning and the end, but in between, we're going to wander around and see what happens. 
And they were going to take our time between songs. We're going to light cigarettes instead of, you know, yakking at the audience and telling them how much we love um, Peoria, that kind of thing. <laughs> so I, they, Jerry Garcia in particular and the Grateful Dead modeled this absolutely no bullshit performing style. And once I got hooked on that, I just couldn't go back to that other way of doing things. So 72, what a great year to get on the bus. Yes. I know. <laughs> was Bear still the sound man at that point, or he had started serving a sentence? I have no idea. I didn't really start paying attention to what was going on inside that world until some years later. I was just a fan at a great distance. I mean, I know he was around because he very famously fell off the stage at the Oakland Stadium in 1974. So I, I think he'd gotten out of jail, but I don't think he was the front of house sound guy at that time. I started... I joined the staff of BAM magazine in 1976 and as a music journalist and was immediately given the, the uh, dead ahead column, you know, following what's going on in the dead world and, and uh, posting news about it and stuff. And that's when I started going to the office and hanging out and meeting people. And that's when I started doing interviews with band members, which led to those relationships and stuff. But in the beginning, I was just buying a ticket and going to the show, and I had no idea that I was about to enter a, an entire parallel universe full of amazing wonders. Yes, that's great. Can you expand a little bit more on that on when you first started to meet the band members and you, how you developed friendships with them? Well, I uh, when, when BAM asked me to take over the Dead Ahead column, I started going over to the Grateful Dead office. I would call the office and talk to Eileen Law, who was the Dead Head's liaison with the band and stuff. And I'd just go over and hang out, and they would give me the, uh, you know, the... Uh, press releases with the upcoming uh, shows and things like that. And I, I just, I, I don't really have a strong memory of it. And again, I was just hanging out and having fun and trying to make connections, but I, I didn't have any kind of uh, program of, you know, making myself a, a part of that thing. I just wandered, and wandered in and hung out, you know, I, uh, for my first interview with a band member, I think, was with Mickey on the phone. He got in a car accident and broke his collarbone in the mid-77, so they had to cancel some shows, and he and I interviewed him on the, on the phone. And then in August of 77, I went to L.A. to interview Bob Weir while he was in the middle of making his second solo album, Heaven Help the Fool. And after that, I had his number, and we stayed in touch, and, and uh, I'd, I'd go hang out with him here and there and did other stuff in 81 uh Blair Jackson and I interviewed Jerry over two two days in the spring uh one day in April and one day in June and that for a cover story in BAM magazine and that interview also wound up in conversations with the dead and 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 I also interviewed Phil Lesh which was a rare thing he didn't do a lot of press but in 1981 he sat for an interview with me and that was one of those moments when like he he got it immediately that I was a musician and that I was coming at him with more intelligent questions than the stuff he was you know used to getting I guess so we also connected and he invited me up to his house to uh, uh, talk about music he wanted to show me the conductor scores for some orchestral pieces and stuff so uh, hell yes I'll come up it was like spending a day with your favorite college professor right. So I became friendly with Phil and started hanging out with him a little bit. And this was uh, when he was still single. He met, he started going out with Jill in 82. So it, it just, I was there. I was part of it. I was, I was getting free tickets to shows and stuff, but. Well, I love that. It seems to me that, you know, every time I hear somebody who has a connection to the dead family, even Big Steve described his initial meeting. This, I just showed up. I was there. I was talking with people. And the next thing I knew, I had found a place and I was in and I was, you know, kind of part of the group. And I, I like that kind of organic way that, you know, either you're on the bus or you're not, right? Either you get there and it's the type of people you want to be with and they want to be with you and or it's not. And if it is, then, you know, good for everybody. You just kind of find a way to make it work. It's been said, Dennis McNally uh, and others have noted that the Grateful Dead is very much an external manifestation of the inside of Jerry Garcia's head. And that Jerry, a lot of decisions were made on Jerry's instinct. And some bad decisions were made on Jerry's instinct as well. I, of course, believe that inviting me into their world was a very smart move on their part, but others have had differing opinions on that. 
But it was that kind of thing. They they hired people, uh, not necessarily on a whim, but on an instinct. And and Jerry once told me that, too, in an interview up at Bill's house in 83. He said, just hang out, man. If one of these days you'll find yourself handing somebody a wrench and then you'll be on the team. It's that kind of thing. And I found my niche, which wound up being at arm's length from the Grateful Dead. I mean, I never worked for them. I never had a job in the Grateful Dead organization. I contracted with them on lots of things. I worked on New Year's Eve broadcasts and stuff. And I had a licensing agreement with them to do the Grateful Dead Hour. But I was never an employee there. And that kept me safe through all kinds of weird bullshit, you know, and layoffs and all the other stuff. Like after Jerry died and they downsized the company, I kept my job because I wasn't being paid by them. I was doing what I was doing externally. So I, I found my niche, which ironically led to my spending less time on the Grateful Dead scene. Because when I started doing a radio show, producing it in my home studio in Oakland in 19, the late 80s and early 90s, producing a radio show was a full-time job. I had a eight-track tape recorder and a giant mixer and a bunch of stuff, and I was uh, mastering material on reels of tape and then performing the reels of tape onto the eight track and all this amazingly complicated shit you had to do in those days. And then doing a mix down from eight track onto a two track and then duplicating dozens of copies of the show to send out. So I couldn't go on tour and see dead shows because I was stuck at home making the damn radio show. So now, wait a minute though, now I can do my radio show anywhere. I produce it on this laptop that I'm using to talk to you guys, and I can edit my show on an airplane. The only time I need silence is five minutes a week to do the voiceover work for the Grateful Dead Hour. Other, All the rest of the work I can do on my laptop with the tools that are in there. So now I could tour, and I do. I mean, I haven't got, got, gone out and played a gig in a year and a half, but... For the last 20 years, I've been a touring musician, and I've been because it's possible to produce the radio show anywhere. So, all, all of my ways of living have converged into a manageable flow of all this work and somehow get the mortgage paid. That's all I ask in so, life. So, for many of us, I certainly, for me, uh, the Deadhead Hour, the Dead Hour, the Grateful Dead Hour was you know, the show that we waited for all week because that was at the time, you know, before there was Sirius XM and before there was the internet and before there was all sorts of things, that's where we would go to wait and to hear what dead songs were going to be played. And I always used to laugh because it reminded me when I was even younger and on Saturday nights, I wanted to stay up late to listen to Don Kirshner's rock concert because I would always hope that, oh, he's going to play this song from somebody I've been listening to or that song from somebody I was listening to. And, you know, but it was the same thing. You know, now, of course, like you say, I can go on my computer. I can pull down any Grateful Dead show that's ever been played anywhere, anytime. But, you know, I mean, for when, at the time, what you guys were doing, and even still now, I... I, I don't know about you, but I, I always go on a road trip and I bring along all the CDs and everything that I've been meaning to play and listen to, and I figure I'll have lots of time. I turn on the Deadhead channel, and I find that I enjoy more the surprise of waiting for what they're going to play as opposed to putting on a show where I know what I'm going to be listening to. I, I understand that feeling. Um, I, I that's Another one of the synergies of my life is that I would do... I would stuff my phone full of Grateful Dead concerts and audition material for my radio show while I'm driving from gig to gig on tour. And so now I haven't I haven't driven to a gig outside the Bay Area in a year and a half. So my extended listening time is limited nowadays because I'm not in the car for long stretches. But I'm still doing that. I'm still curating this music and still trying to turn people onto it. I realize in a way, kind of the availability of everything on the internet kind of frees me up so in a way because nobody's demanding something from me that they can't hear somewhere else. I am able to bring things up and unearth new treasures and bring them to people, but it doesn't have the urgency that it had back in the day you're talking about when I was like one of the primary sources of new stuff. So now what I do is like, for example, I'm I'm listening because I'm working for Nugsnet on the Dead & Company tour. I'm listening to every show really carefully live and making notes and pulling out favorite moments from all the Dead & Company shows. And now I've got like, I don't know, seven, eight hours of highlights of, of uh, Dead & Company shows that I'm going to put on the air on the Grateful Dead Hour over the next few months. 
that kind of thing. So I'm still, and I'm pulling out favorite old shows from the Grateful Dead archive and also pulling up new stuff, you know, like Michaela Davis interpreting Birdsong on the harp and stuff like that. I mean, the, the Grateful Dead world is more full of amazing stuff today than it was 25 years ago. Yes, uh, we're looking forward to our four Dead and Company shows here in Colorado next month. We're going to get two at Red Rocks and two at Fiddler's Green. So we're looking forward to that return. And I did see Bob Weir up there with uh, the Wolf Brothers earlier uh, in the summer. And boy, was that a great show. People were saying that was the best Bob Weir show they'd ever seen. And I'd had to agree with that. <clears throat> but I have a question for you that I get um, as probably uh, one of the older people at Fish Concerts. I go with my sons, who are 23 and 33, big Fish fans. And their whole group of friends says to me, Jim... How, how does Fish compare to the Grateful Dead? I mean, were the Grateful Dead as, as good as Fish? And my answer, and I look forward to um, your answer, David, is, you know, it was a different time and a different place, but, you know, Fish has blazing, blazing jams and sets, but their lyrics are not up to speed with Ripple or, you know, uh, Box of Rain. Ain't no time to hate, you know? Your, your interpretation. I, 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 I'm not really qualified. I've listened to a little bit of Fish, but it was one of those things. My life as a Grateful Dead curator and a musician in my own right has meant that I don't have time to pay attention to much of anything else. I mean, in my private life, my wife and I go to theater, we go to movies and stuff like that, but I, I'm not a big... I don't have time to listen to anything else beyond the stuff. You know, like I saw Fish live once... I, I agree. What I've heard of their songwriting doesn't impress me that much, but what I've seen of their discipline and their development of their own unique language, I mean, they followed the model of the Grateful Dead in a certain way and made a culture of their own and a music of their own that takes into account different sources than what the Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead were a folk rock band that turned into a psychedelic band that turned into a blues rock band that turned into an arena rock band, blah, blah, blah. Fish began kind of combining like, you know, Frank Zappa and funk and stuff like that. So their roots are different, but they did the same thing of creating a common language that they speak that includes gestural stuff from the music and references to their own musical history in this exactly the same way the Grateful Dead do it. But it's like the same kind of syntax with a different vocabulary. And I, I, I can't judge fish because I haven't spent nearly enough time listening to them. And that's my, just the fact of my life. So I, 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 I recuse myself from the fish sucks discussion by saying that I have a, a, a total admiration for what they've done with the with with their music and building their culture and and recognizing that it's similar but different from this one yeah so um I'll, I'll jump in for a quick second I mean you, you bring up the Grateful Dead culture and you bring up you know like meeting Eileen Law back in the day and I'm guessing that was probably at Front Street when you did it no, at the dead office. At the, at the dead office. Got it. Okay. She, she was in the dead office at Fifth and Lincoln, not at Front. Got it. So it was when, you, when you think about like the way the, uh, the Grateful Dead um, organize themselves or disorganize themselves between you know, having all these different entities and Ice Nine publishing and Round Records and all the other things that they did, and you think about how other bands have tried to emulate that, like, do you think that the, the Grateful Dead way of doing things had a profound impact on other bands that came after them to say, okay, we can actually control our content, we can actually, like, you know, be masters of our destiny without being slaves to a record company, that, you know, if we get this thing right, we can actually keep this this huge group going? And also, did that contribute to sort of the pressure that Garcia felt towards the end of having to keep this many people on uh, on the road and, and working? That, you know, for me, it's some of the great ironies. You just had that. That's a separate question. <laughs> well, one at a time, then. Well... Yes, Jerry felt a ridiculous, tremendous weight on him. I, I think he was the, the tent pole of an immense, immense circle of people. And the weight of it fell directly on his shoulders. There were the dozens of people that were directly employed by the Grateful Dead, another several dozen people that were contractors and partners of the Grateful Dead, hundreds of people uh, that they did business with in, in uh, supporting and going out on tour and all that stuff, and then thousands and thousands and thousands of fans. So hearts and wallets would have been broken if the Grateful Dead stopped. And it was all on Jerry. And they were saying to him, you're killing yourself at the same time. I mean, 
I, I wasn't privy to all that, and we've read books about it. And I, but I was around for some of the time when Jerry was starting to get really fucked up, and people didn't know what to do about it. And I think there's a lot of deeply conflicted people who recognize that this cash cow was killing himself, and everybody watched it happen with varying degrees of effectuality, I guess. I mean, nobody could stop him. Nobody could get Jerry to clean up his act, right? So they cashed the checks. They did the gigs and stuff. And I, I think there was a lot of really, really deep uh, emotional conflict among people all through that time. The other question, the earlier question, hell yes, there's dozens of bands that model themselves directly on the Grateful Dead thing. They invented this and by the way, the rest of the music industry came around to the Grateful Dead model because the Grateful Dead never organized themselves around selling records, which the rest of the music business did. In the, in, the, in the classic era, when I was a music journalist, musicians would make bands and then they uh, make records and then they would go on tour to market the records. They would do in stores at record stores, but they'd go out and they'd play gigs to get people to buy their records. Now, you give away the record to get people to come buy a ticket to the gig. Nobody's buying music anymore, so you have to go out and play gigs to make a living, which was the Grateful Dead's way all the way. But the rest now, that's, you know, like Steely Dan will do, like, oh, we're doing an all-request tour. The Eagles can't go out and play the same exact fucking show 15 times and expect anybody to go more than once. The Grateful Dead built a model that's the opposite of that. You want to go to every show you possibly can, and you'll buy the record to help them so that they'll feel inspired to make another record. But the records don't drive that thing. The live music does. And that's where the rest of the business came around to. But in the immediate wake of that, Fish is a great example. Uh, later than that, along came, you know, Mo and Widespread Panic and um, Spin Doc, you know, all the Horde bands and all that stuff. They were, I, I was hanging out with Mo. I played gigs and stuff with Mo in the late 90s. And they were doing a thing that was very specifically modeled on what the Grateful Dead were doing. They were they had relationships with their fans. They were doing community building things. They collected names and addresses and they serviced their audience with mailing lists. They promoted tape trading and all that kind of stuff. So they borrowed everything that the Grateful Dead kind of did instinctually and did it by design and built their careers on it successfully. Yeah, I think Chuck and Al and, and uh, Rob did a really nice job in that regard. I think those guys, like if you look at how loyal the following is every year when they play in turn in New York for, uh, for Modown, it's amazing because it's such a fun, intimate um, gathering of just like hardcore fans that have been following Mo for years and years. And for all the people that don't you know, spend time with that band, they are so much fun. And, they're, and then they've got such a great camaraderie with their fan base. I agree. It's been a long time since I spent much time with them, but I remember doing gigs with them. And we did this thing called the Merry Danksters with Chuck and Al and Vinny and, and a few other ringers. That was just huge fun. But what you're talking about, yeah, they there was a real esprit among those people. And they were a, a team and a family. And they, they demonstrated that style of, yeah, t you know, loving your audience and, uh, and, 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 enlisting them and in, in using what became known as viral marketing. David, let me ask you this. We were, you were talking a few minutes ago about, uh, you know, kind of uh, the new generation almost of, of, of fans that are coming along. And, you know, that's the thing that really impresses me about this. When I was at Wrigley Field uh, this past weekend, just based on my own very loose observations, I would have to guess that at least half the people in attendance were under the age of 30, you know, and, and, and that was impressive enough. But it wasn't just that they were attending the show, right? They were dressed like deadheads. They danced like deadheads. They smoked and dosed like deadheads. They smelled like deadheads, right? The great unwashed masses, as my mom used to always call us. They knew every word, every song. And they knew the cue lines, headlight on a northbound train. Right. All, this is my kid's generation. I never listened to anything from my father's generation. Nothing at all. He's got uh, Broadway shows and uh, Tchaikovsky and all of that. And it never had any interest for me. But my kids, when they were younger, they hated it because I made them listen to it so much. Now, every time I, I turn around, a, a CD is missing, a vinyl is missing that they've yanked out because they want to go listen to it. It's wonderful. I go to shows with them. We have a great time. This generation is as much into it as we were. I mean, they're, it's as if they're still going to the shows, and they are. It's just not quite the same. But even without Jerry, 
the love for this. I mean, you know, 40,000 people just don't show up in Wrigley Field on a night with huge rain unless, you know, there's really something you want to connect with. I know we talked a little bit before about maybe how that happens, but is, is this something that kind of like the Beatles music be, just becomes eternal? Third, fourth, fifth generations when the core four are gone, when, you know, now John Mayer and Jeff Comenti are the living connections and can this continue? Does it does it really speak to that side of people? To me, you know, that's what makes being a deadhead so unique because it's not just the music. There's a lifestyle. There's a, a the, the, all of it that just comes together when you follow the Grateful Dead. It, it I we know now, you know, fourth generation deadheads. How cool is that? It's it's like it's like any other hobby or culture subculture in 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 this world, you know. It it it's interesting enough to attract a particular kind of person and be left alone by the rest of the world. You know, Jerry famously said it's like licorice. If you really like licorice, you really like licorice. And if you don't, you don't. That's fine. Leave us alone to do our thing. But it's attractive enough. I used to think back in the eighties when like MTV did a uh, Day of the Dead in like 1987, around the time that um, uh, In the Dark came out, and they sent camera crews out, and and they it was they were promoting the party in the parking lot. They never got to talk about the music. Stephen Marcus, who was running Grateful Dead ticket sales at, in those days, I interviewed him for my uh, most recent book. This is all a dream we dreamed, and he thinks that that was the beginning of the end for the dead when people were drawn to the party and the the drugs and all that stuff and and were not indoctrinated or uh, uh, exposed to the music and the the thing that was the driving force for us the rest of it grew up around our love for the music but then of course as is the case with any kind of attractive scene people came to it for the scene without regard to the music and so the tail began to wag the dog in in, in that sense but it, it's compelling enough and and we who love it try to turn our friends onto it. One of my favorite things in my life as a traveling musician is to meet people, which I do on every tour, who will walk up to me and say, I'm a deadhead because of your radio show. And my standard answer is, I hope your parents have forgiven me. And then I just pat myself on the back for having recruited another, uh, you know, family member. Because I, I, the radio show... Put the music. I, I wasn't advertising tie dyes and and drug use and dancing in the halls. I was playing the music on the radio. I was trying to draw people in with the music. So I, when people say they got into the dead because of the radio show, that means to me that they got in because of the music, and that makes me proud. So it's interesting you say that because you know I'm a little bit younger than all of you guys, and so for me I was kind of like the 2.0 or 3.0 version where. I got to see, you know, Garcia play almost 150 times with the Grateful Dead and another, you know, 50 with Garcia band, but I didn't start seeing shows until 88. So like when I came to, to the scene was after like sort of the touch heads came in and, and already kind of destroyed the scene. And I remember like Dennis McNally and Steve Marcus sitting at the table and like checking for counterfeit tickets. And I remember those guys kind of like being like mentors to me as far as educating about, you know, what your behavior should be like in the lot and how you should act and, you know, what you shouldn't do. Um, you know, those years when you and I were sort of uh, going back and forth via email, you know, I, I didn't get to see the sort of the, the either primal dead years or kind of the heyday of like the Americana years. But I did get to see, you know, the later years, which I know a lot of people sort of dismiss as, you know, not really the best um, period of the Grateful Dead. But that was the only Grateful Dead I knew was 88 to 95. And I'm wondering if like, you know, as, as you think about it and you turn people on through different eras, um, you know, to Larry's point, did you see a change in, in kind of the evolution? Did you see a change in, in how people interpret it? Because, you know, I, I think that I probably looked at the Grateful Dead in a much different way post-Touch of Grey than, than kids did when they, you know, saw it, like, post, like, Magoo's Pizza. Our theory, the scholars agree, I think, that everybody's favorite Grateful Dead is the first one they heard. And when I started feeling uh, sad about the things that were missing in the Brent era... I had to remind myself that probably more than half of the people at the show with me never heard the Grateful Dead before the Brent era, et, et cetera, et cetera. So the nice thing about this music is you get on board here and you still have a chance to go back and catch up on all the years that you missed. But everybody's favorite is the one that hooked them. And 
whatever my beef is with the Brent era, you know, Bobby dropped a bunch of his tunes in the Brent era and replaced them with utterly useless covers of blues tunes. Like, who the fuck <laughs> needed to hear the Grateful Dead do C.C. Ryder when he could yes. have been playing Black Throated Wind? Thank you, thank you. Right? It's a waste of our time. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, Bobby, I love you, but Walkin' Blues? So many better songs you could have been playing in that spot, Blues Boy. But if that's what people got on board with, and that's that's what they... And, and that also, you know, the taping thing, there were more tapes in circulation from later years and all. So I just think it it's... There are so many different Grateful Deads that we can't really judge people who are whose favorite one is, you know, a few degrees off from our favorite one. There's a, like a 360 degrees of Grateful Deaddom, and I got on over here, and if you got on over here... You know, you're relating to a different band in a lot of ways. I mean, I know people that just could never make room in their hearts for Vince Wellnick, and it made me so sad, you know? I love Tomorrow Never Knows. I was so happy when they started playing that with Vince. But, you know, what you say, David, is so true. And and even to the point now where the the kids, my kids, who are getting on the bus through Dead & Co., uh, you know, to them, John Mayer is the sound of the Grateful Dead. And what's fascinating is a couple of years ago, I was at Folsom Field in uh, in Boulder to see a couple of shows. And there was a whole group of us hanging out. And the, there were some kids literally on the bench behind us who maybe were just uh, freshmen in college or something, but very young and just kind of finding their way into the dead. But they knew all the tunes and they jumped into Althea. Oh, they said, Althea, well, let me tell you, you know, listen to John. This is his favorite dead song. He kills this tune. He plays it so great. I love listening. The jams are so good. And finally, after a pause, he said, you know, I think he plays it better than Jerry. And I, I, you know, far be it for me to question anybody else's opinions, but I just kind of stopped and I turned and I said, look, everybody has their opinion. You're entitled to it. I heard Garcia play that tune live more times than I could count on his worst night. I'd rather hear Garcia play that tune than John Mayer. I, I know it's your time, my time. Go home and listen to a Dick's Picks. Find it. <laughs> listen to it a few times. And you and you can still hear it. It's, you don't have to trust me. You can go hear it. But it, but it, later when I thought about it, what you say is true. This, is, to them, is what it's all about. And, and it's perfectly valid music. That's the other thing. You know, we don't, we don't get to privilege our version over their version. And um, uh, one of the... Uh, prevalence or the the uh, broad distribution of Grateful Dead tribute bands around the country is an amazing testament to the power of the music. And I know a lot of people are getting on board from seeing a local band play this music. And then you go back to the source of it, and then you hear how it's done by the real pros, et cetera, et cetera, and work your way into it. There are so many different ways to appreciate the music that you just you can't really privilege one over the other. And I think right now the the Mayor Kimenti bromance is the most coolest damn thing that's happening on that stage right now. And I almost have a feeling that Bobby is stepping back a little bit to let them do that. You know, I'm I'm watching him. He's he had a, a like a rough night one of the last nights in Chicago. I'm not sure why, but you know, uh, it's. I don't feel like he's failing. You know, he looks healthy as hell. He's the guy's totally fucking buff. But I, I, I. He's got the caprice to prove I, it. <laughs> yeah, that's right, showing them legs. But I really feel like he's encouraging those guys to step up and shine, and they're shining. And w- that right there, it doesn't matter who's playing it. The music is happening, and that's. That's right there, the, the, the instrumental conversation between those two guys over that groove is, you know, like, where, where else would you want to be on the planet than right there at that moment? And that's exactly how we felt watching Jerry 40 years ago. So we can't privilege our version of it over their version of it because they're getting it right now. Well, it was interesting because I, I, you know, I will admit that sometimes, you know, to get up and go to Dead & Co., I'll think, ah, you know, it's Dead & Co., it's not Jerry. But I went both nights, had a great time both nights, but the second night I was talking to some buddies on the phone, and they're like, yeah, just blow out of there at set break, you know, we'll meet you. And I said, let me see what's going on. And at set break, I stood up and I thought, 
nah, I'll just see what they open with the second set. They open, okay, nah, you know, let's see if they play such and such, trying to see if I could remember what they might play. Are you play. talking about okay. Saturday? Okay. Yes. Yes. Then, I, well, let's wait and see what they come out of space with. And I knew, I, you know, Days Between, which is a tune that for me was always a complicated one because it was just really starting to come online at the end. And a bunch of Jerry's new tunes were just starting to come online. And, you know, I never really got a chance to develop a full appreciation for it with Jerry. And it just kind of fell into this new tunes bin in the back of my brain. And when the Dead first, when Dead and Cohen Dial started first playing it again, it just kind of felt like, why are you playing that, man? There's all these other great tunes to play. But I love that song. And, you know, now that I've heard it enough times. So I said, fine. I'm gonna, And before I knew it, it was the second encore. And I hadn't left. And I just thought, I, no, I, you know, it, it doesn't matter. When you're there, you're there. Where else, where else would I rather be right now, hanging out with my buddies or listening to these guys? And I have to put in a good word for Days Between, man. I always love that song from the fo- first moment I heard it. And uh, I started performing it a couple years ago. I, I'm in a, an occasional trio called Fragile Thunder with the harpist Anella Lauren and a slack key guitarist from Hawaii named Stephen Inglis. And when two or three of us have gone out and played, Stephen sings um, Days Between. And I've had, uh, like a, on a dozen occasions, had this amazing, profound experience of standing behind him and accompanying him while he plays that song. And it's, I, I, the, one of the reasons I love it so much is that it's our story too. We were along on a lot of those. And, I, you know, whatever whatever event or venue or pose any given line in that song conjures up for you, some of them will be similar to the ones they conjure for me and and the, what the band themselves saw, right? So I started doing that song myself in my solo show a little over a year ago, and I, I found myself in tears doing it a number of times. It's so just so deep, and it's, again, because it's our story too, it, it made it even easier to sort of get inside that song and inhabit it because it felt like, like us. Yes, and for our fans out there who may not be as familiar with that song, you know, we grew into our shoes. We told them where to go. And uh, there, that has four verses, and each verse is a chapter in a man or a woman's life. And it starts out with old age and then goes back to the whole life. And that's what that song is about, according to my Grateful Dead lyrics annotated. I, uh... There, I, I see specific pictures when I sing certain lines, you know, and and it, it also just think about the the tone of that. It's a valedictory on those guys. And Hunter, he was every everybody was watching Jerry die for several years, and he was writing songs with this guy. And whatever else was going on, they not, their songwriting never wavered. You know, there's a few clinkers here and there, but yeah, I even love Keep Your Day Job. But the last couple songs they wrote together were as good as anything anybody ever wrote. And that is the the, the sorrowful tone of that song and so many roads coming out of a guy who was 53 and looked 75. You know, where it, that's that's deep shit. Where, and, and for Bob to sing that now, it, it's it's important that he sing that now. Yes, I agree. Yes, I love that song. But to jump to the other extreme, I'm really tired of Lost Sailor. You, what? Seriously? It's so, sl- it's, oh, it's so slow. I, I missed that song for years. That was one of the songs I bitched about when he stopped doing it. I like the fact that they yes. would do Sane of Circumstance, which is a great song on its own. And it was particular coming out of, sometimes they would do Terrapin or t- Saint into Terrapin, which is a fabulous pairing. But I was bummed when they stopped doing Saint Sailor and I'm really glad they brought it back. So I'm curious as to why you don't like it. Okay. It's just that it's very slow. He's a lost sailor, has been too long at sea. So anyway, I'll give it another listen, this Dead and Company show coming up. I'm I, sure we'll I, get it, it at least listen once. Listen to what John is doing on it. He's taken some of the the compositional stuff that Jerry orchestrated in the song, but he's also got whole areas where he's making his own textures in it, and it's really great. I feel like this tour, Mayer has been more confident in his own voice and bringing his own thing into it um 
to a greater degree. And I think that it, it is he was being very careful for the first few years, and now I think he's being encouraged and rewarded with stepping up and making it more his own sound. So I think it's interesting, you, like we're talking about some of the ballads that uh, Garcia used to play, and obviously like, you know, um, So Many Roads and, uh, and Days Between with its like, you know, haunting uh, alliteration that, that happens in that song. And, you know, even some of the other ballads, I think for my era, were some of the best things that happened to the Grateful Dead. And, you know, one of the things we we're going to talk about today is how, you know, a song like Standing on the Moon, really from like 1991 forward, just kept getting better and better and better until ultimately, you know, by 93, 94, despite how they were playing in a lot of other parts of the show, some of the Jerry ballads would just be, you know, exceptional. So down, down if you've got the, uh, the Boston Garden, I think it's 925, uh, 93 queued up, but maybe play just a quick little bit of that just to kind of talk about on the other the side. The one I studied was 926. Nine nine twenty six. Thank you. Yeah, nine. Pardon me. Nine twenty six. Ninety three. It's exactly right. It's, it's, Don't switch shows on me now, boys. <laughs> it was, uh, it was six nights at the Boston Garden after six nights at MSG. Yeah, it was an eight, eighteen show fall tour. Um, yeah. Speaks for itself. And they ended the set after that song. And it, I mean, if you look at the set list, there must have been another song in, you know, I mean, the ordinary thing would have been to go into Sugar Magnolia or Good Lovin' or something coming out of that, but they ended the show on it. And even with that horrible sounding guitar that Jerry was using in those days, he played his butt off on it. I mean, I, I listened to the show yesterday in preparation for this conversation, and it was... It's distressing in a way to hear it. I mean, he's fumbling the lyrics a lot. I mean, you know, he's an impaired guy. And for some reason, he was using this guitar that had some kind of direct... Lightning bolt. I, I, don't, I don't care what it was called. It sounded horrible. You could hear the clank of the strings against the frets. The, the bit you just played, he's playing this big, um, you know over uh, overdrive guitar and it sounds really great but even then you can still hear this horrible little thin sound underneath the notes i can't imagine why he liked that tone kind of, and also 93 was one of those years where he had like a few beautiful bright stretches but there was a lot of really sad stuff like i i was the the uh cal expo May 93, obviously, is like a peak yeah, I was there. for the era. And then there was a couple of nights out in, in the Midwest in June that I liked enough to play both of them on the radio over a couple of years. But there's just a lot of just kind of shaky jare going on, and you hear a ton of it in that show, unfortunately. So, David, one of the things that um, you know we've talked about on our show from time to time is I just saw fish at uh, Deer Creek. My kids love it, and for me, it's a good way to make a connection with them. Trey is now the same age Jerry was when Jerry died. Wow. And, you know, Trey is clean and going strong. And, you know, the, the the thing about that, they make a lot of it in the fish community, Fish 1.0, 2.0, is that whenever that break was, and I, I assume it was between 2 and 3 or whatever, when the band just said, that's it, we're done, it was this, you know, I think they saw the same kind of thing happening with Trey, and, and his uh, issues with, with uh, hard drugs. And they just stepped away and said, you know, we have this community, but but we, we have to look at the future and we can't do it without. And they did it. And, I'm you know, I'm, we're all very grateful, I guess, especially the big fish fans that, you know, Trey is around so lively. One of the things you said about Jerry was whether he wanted help. And I'm, I just think of this bit in, uh, again, in Big Steve's book about how he was there with Jerry when Jerry was going through the detox and through all the craziness in the hospital or the rehab center and he was the guy you know who was there with him and then when it was finally time for Jerry to go home a group of them got in the car with him they drove him home and Steve started to go in the house with him and he said no no I don't I'm fine I'm going to be on my own tonight I don't need you 
and Steve tried to go and he wouldn't have him. And he said we all knew he was going back in the house to start using yeah. again. And is, is it maybe just that there was nothing anybody could do with Jerry, that he just set himself down a road where there was no recovery? John McIntyre once told me that Jerry was both the smartest and stupidest person he'd ever known. I, I think, and, and I we saw it. I mean, he was an amazingly resilient dude. And even at his most fucked up, he was articulate. And he was present. You know, he never lost his marbles. But I don't think he ever had his a certain kind of spiritual backbone or moral backbone or something. I mean, he I, I think he was a, um, a, a self-esteem case. You know, I don't think he I think he's a guy who maybe had a bit of imposter syndrome behind this being this incredibly you know, being the most important thing on earth to a few hundred thousand people can put a pressure on a guy. And I think that he probably felt unworthy of that in certain ways. And he also took great advantage of the unlimited power that it visited upon him. He had the economic power. I, I'm not privy to what went on among the band members, although I was around at various times, like in the early 80s when he's... his his health started to get kind of shaky, you know, but it, they couldn't get him to take care of himself. And ultimately, as we all know, it's exactly the same as with suicides. You you cannot blame anybody but him. And it was a, it's a right. form of suicide. Right. I got it. Yeah. Well, so <clears throat> I know we only have you for a few more minutes. You've been incredibly gracious with your time tonight. So, uh, I'd like to ask just a couple of rapid fire questions if I can, and then uh, if it's possible, can we listen to a little bit of a little bit of your music as well right afterwards? I sent some over. Awesome. Okay, so fun rapid fire questions with us tonight. Uh, what's your favorite dead song? Dark Star. What's your favorite lyric? Could never narrow it down. Once in a while, you get shown the light in the strangest of places if you look at it right. You ain't gonna learn what you don't want to know. Nice, Scarlet. One from each guy. Excellent, black throated. And uh, what was your favorite year? If you were to pick one year, uh, what would be the one you'd listen to? 73. Awesome. So the, uh... Because it's smack in the middle of the three best years. Yep. And it's because it's it's like 72, only there's a bunch of new songs for them to play with. Weather reports and wave that flag. And it's better than 74 because they weren't they, they weren't burdened by the wall of sound. And there's just, you there's no such thing as a bad 1973 show. And they had the great China Rider transition jam that was totally different than any other year. It was just a much different. And and it's the year that that introduced uh, Eyes of the World and Weather Report Suite. Weather Report came on later in the year. Every every new song, because they were so good at not repeating themselves, every new song or major composition the Dead brought in expanded their harmonic and rhythmic horizons into some new region that they could explore. It's like, uh, in a way, it's like a, another peninsula of musical style, and then they'd figure out a bridge from that peninsula over to that one. So they're crossing and blending styles from all these places. So every new song, think about Eyes of the World, you know that that rhythm is different. The that has it had that sort of major seventh scale that was used rarely in the Grateful Dead world, and then you know, and then along comes uh, Let It Grow or Weather Report Suite, which became another one of those beautiful, enormous, extended Jerry uh, excursion things. So it's just a great year, and the and the telepathy, the fingers on a hand thing. The those guys were all in it together. The you know. The five of those guys, six of the however fucking, yeah, five of those guys, they were all completely listening to one another. And the sound is also uncluttered because there's no string pads and there's no second drummer and there's none of these confusing factors. You can recognize each instrumental voice and, and you can hear what each person is saying in the conversation. And they're all fully engaged in it. And all of this raving about this one era does not is not meant to denigrate any other period of Grateful Dead music, but it's one of it's just the clarity and focus and level of inspiration and general health of the Grateful Dead in seventy three is remarkable. And then uh, two more two more last questions. Uh, you, what, what's your favorite venue to see the Grateful Dead, and what's your favorite favorite venue as a musician to play? My favorite venue to play as a musician is probably uh, any. Any living room full of people. 
I love house. I I've played big venues, you know, but and I love playing clubs and stuff. But I really like being at, playing in a house concert that's well attended, where everybody is in the room to hear me play, and you can make eye contact with everybody in the room. There is nothing like that experience. My favorite venue to see the Grateful Dead would have to probably be the Frost Amphitheater. Uh, but the Greek is right behind it, and I would not say no to another chance to go to Winterland. But acoustically and from the, from the standpoint of having an amazing day, seeing the Grateful Dead at the Frost and the Greek was always it's awesome. All Bay Area, Stanford, Berkeley, and, uh, and, and SF, huh? I, 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 I haven't been to a lot of other venues. I never saw the Dead at Deer Creek. I've never been to... I saw them at the High Life Fronton in Miami in 1978. I saw them at the Garden once or twice in the 90s. But, you know, I I didn't tour, so I didn't see them in all of the... I didn't see them in Telluride. I, you know, I'm my data set is mostly Bay Area venues. Final question, then I'll be done, is um, if you take one of the other uh, released discs, uh, either like a Dick's Picks or a Dave's Picks, which one would you take if it was a Desert Island pick for you and that's all you had? You mean the Dave's Picks series or the Dick's Picks series? Like a, anything that Grateful Dead released as, a, as an album or a live album, if you were to say, hey, there's one, one recording that's out there that people can purchase, which one would it be? Oh, God. The uh, Pacific Northwest boxed set. Yes. I love that one. It doesn't get nearly enough credit. Larry and I must be like the same age and the same astrological sign or something because he's like completely ratifying everything I say over here. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so lovely to hear all of this. I love that. My wife likes it because it's such pretty artwork. You know, I had a harder time with the Europe 72 box set. It looks like it's just a big suitcase. She's like, put it with all the other suitcases. But the the, the Pacific, I love the artwork on that one. It's beautiful. And it's it spans that era, 70, 72, 73, 72. The St. Louis one that's coming up is another like vertical tasting, right? 70, 71, 72, 73. That's like. I'm from St. Louis. I was born and raised in St. Louis, but when they were ah. playing those shows, I was 10 and 11 years old. So that was before my time. I started seeing them in the summer of 82 in California. They played St. Louis that summer at the Keel Opera House, but then they didn't come back again until 94, 95. I had tickets to see them at the Fox Theater in 86. They were going to play two shows there again, but then Jerry went into his coma and they had to cancel those shows. So I kept the tickets, but they didn't do me any good. I never got to see them there. I understand. So are we going to talk about cannabis or what? Sure. Let's talk about it. We can always talk about cannabis. Uh... Oh, that's right. We're going to talk about my music. Well, I have a few minutes. Well, I, I, I consider ca cannabis a performance enhancing drug. And I use it, I use it primarily for creative uh, occasions. Like right now, I've, I'm an hour and a half into the cookie that I eat every day for my live show, and I'm going to have a pipe load of some, uh, as it happens, Garcia hand-picked indica before I start playing. Nice. You know, we can talk a little bit about cannabis for a minute or two. Did you ever think you'd see this day where you can walk down the street and buy legal cannabis? I think it's wonderful. Uh, functionally, though, for me, I, pot has always been legal in my lifetime. I mean, I, I was arrested as a 15-year-old for being in a car where pot was uh, you know, spotted by a policeman, but it, I, the, it's the only time I've ever had any risk of any, I mean, in, to be a, a hippie kid in California is to not worry about whether pot is legal or not. So it's a, it's different for me in that sense, you know, like it's, it, the difference between then and now is much greater in a lot of other places and a lot of other cultures and age groups, but fuck yeah, it's great to be able to get on my bike and ride downtown and pick up, you know, a jar of some new strain I've never had before. Uh, we also, we, my wife grows a, a plant in our backyard every year, so I don't really have to pay for pot either. I buy edibles for the fun of it. So here's my question. Please settle an age-old argument. When Jerry was playing, when the dead were playing, and Jerry would turn around and walk back to his speaker, was he smoking a cigarette or was he smoking a joint? People smoked pot in that world on that stage. I'm, I know Phil did and I know Mickey did. Uh, and I'm pretty, I'm assuming Bill did, but the ones that I spent time with that I know were pot smokers were those guys. Bobby, less of a pot smoker. I think Jerry smoked pot all, all the time, but I don't know. So I... Uh, uh I'll give a, sh a quick shout out to uh, the guys from Holistic who produce uh, Garcia's Handpicked. And in where you live, it's my buddies at uh, NorCal Cannabis in Santa Rosa that grow the majority of, uh, of what Holistic sells as Garcia's Handpicked. 
See, I know nothing about their scene. I, 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 I was, I've been, I had been waiting for a local outlet to carry it. There was no place on my side of the bay that had it until recently. So I just went down there and I said, give me the dankest indica you've got. And they gave me something called peanut butter souffle. And I really like it. But I'm not, I'm just, I'm not, I, I've got, between my wife's uh, backyard pot and and little bits that a uh, trimmer friend of mine gives me from time to time, I never have to go down to the store and buy pot. I just smoke what's put in front of me. You know, I'm I'm lucky that way. Right. Well, I had the unique opportunity, David, to uh, try to negotiate the transaction with Trixie and Annabelle prior to a holistic getting it. Wow. So John Blaufarb and I spent a lot of time together, and uh, Mark Allen from Red Light and I spent a lot of time together trying to figure this out. Uh-huh. And uh, we went about a year and a half, and then I started working with the guys over at Roar with Bernie and Sherry and Greg, trying to uh, trying to get the Grateful Dead on board as well. Uh, ultimately, the uh, the transaction didn't work out, and about two years later, they ended up going a different direction with Holistic. But a terrific group, and uh, it was a great way for me to, to get to know some great people. I know I know nothing about any of those things, but I wish there was a way for me to become like an endorser or something. I would I, I'd love to I'd love to be like a spokesman for for the uh, the dankest indica they can find. We can help with that. By the way, if you want like a strain, like the, the GAN strain, I'm sure we can uh, speak to some, some of the right people to make sure that somewhere in NorCal you've got your own strain being grown that's just super sick indica. I, I, I used to think I liked sativas better, but it turns out I think the, the sativas seem to be missing something that I'm getting from indicas. And I don't really, I don't think I really subscribe to the notion that it's a real duality. It seems to me that strain to strain and batch to batch is varied enough that you can't really predict much of anything. I think that's very true. I would absolutely agree with that. But let let me just take it to the next level really quickly while we have another minute or two, because one of the things that was always so central to the Grateful Dead band that wasn't really quite the same, everybody would get high at any rock concert I went to, but LSD was the kind of thing that was talked about at Dead Shows. You know, nobody went to see REO Speedwagon and did acid, uh, you know, but but or maybe they did. I don't know. <laughs> I hope not. But uh, but, you know, it, it always played a role. And certainly in the late 60s, when we kind of talk about the primal dead era. I mean, my favorite box set is the Fillmore West one from 69. I can listen to that over and over and over again. And you can just hear these these tones and these vibes, even the dark stars that are playing that are just oh, yeah. dripping with psychedelic everything and i mean i would by the way i would recommend 12 12 69 for another batch of a dose of that kind of vibe i i dick and i discovered that tape together years ago and both just completely fell in love with it and it got released a few years ago 12 12 69 it's on a dave's picks it's just it has that feral just dripping with psychedelic quality to it it's had a, a caution for the ages so but is it is it the dead playing to the acid or the acid playing the dead you know in, in other, is it just how do the two fit so well together I, do, I don't know how it was with them historically they, you know they sort of famously dosed together and played high but i know various people wouldn't like bobby wasn't taking as much acid he proclaimed himself to be naturally high or whatever <laughs> um and i i don't know about in the later years i really i wasn't privy to their consumption in any meaningful way and uh, my own relationship with acid was I, I I stopped taking it in the early 80s because it was not a, a pleasant experience. And I needed to do some work on myself and become a happier, more integrated adult before I could come back to it. Now I enjoy the hell out of it on the rare occasions when I can find the time to do it. But I stopped dosing at dead shows because it was it, because it was my workplace in a certain way. And because of my weird, unique um, position sort of on the membrane between the inside and the outside, all encounters could be really fraught. So it wasn't a good place to be in a subjective state or a vulnerable state. So I didn't dose at shows. I would dose at safer times. Um, Dan, let's let's uh, play David's music really quickly here because I know he's going to have to hop in a minute. So let's, let's play it. We can get some quick... Uh interaction with him on that in the town that still believes in magic people still buy records in the store the concert hall is filled with people listening you don't find them too Don't find that too often Don't get 
Uh, Scott Guberman and I wrote that song together uh, about uh, two and a half years ago and recorded it with uh, the amazing Robin Sylvester on bass and Greg Anton on drums. Well, it, it's wonderful. And when I hear that line about some the town where they listen to music, they don't do that anymore. And that, you know, is just... I'm just old enough that that is a gripe for me when I'm sitting there and at, at, we stop at Wrigley Field and if you stop, you can almost stop listening to the music and hear the buzz of the conversation. I'm like, you've paid all this money to see these guys. Shut up and listen. Now, Robert Hunter and I wrote a song together called Shut Up and Listen. <laughs> okay. That's on my album, uh, You Are Here. I, I've written two songs with Hunter. The first one was called Like a Dog, and that's on an album called The Ones That Look the Weirdest Taste the Best. The funny thing is about that song, though, I we the first two first two verses are sweet, and they're kind of about hippies, the, uh, the hippie paradise that might be Fairfax, California. And when we were we, we wrote the song in an afternoon over there at Scott's house in Fairfax, and and at the end, I, I we just thought it would be fun to put a completely self-serving special pleading at the end of the song. And but what's weird is, I mean, you know, <laughs> complaining about audiences and people not buying records and stuff is pretty self-serving shit. But it it reads as funny, I hope. But it became extra ironic. Because the concert halls haven't been filled with people listening for quite some time now. So it gave a different meaning to that line that's been a little intense. I really do kind of have to go, you guys. I'm playing a live set in 15 minutes. David, thank you so much. We just really cannot thank you enough for being on our show. I'm happy to uh, rave about this stuff anytime. So, if And if we haven't had a chance to say it, David, uh, we all love your music. So uh, big fans of your music as well as your writing, as well as everything else you've done for the community. So from all of us, thank you for the years and years you've put into uh, to make our lives more enjoyable. So we greatly appreciate it. Thank, it's been a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you. Your listeners should look to, at uh, perfectible.net where I have books and music for sale. And if you buy a book from me, it'll be signed by one or both authors, depending on which book it is. Okay. Excellent. Thank you all again. Thank you, David. Have a great show tonight. Thank you. Awesome. Be well, you guys. Thanks so much, David. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hey everyone, it's Ryan from the Cannabis Connoisseur Podcast. If you're looking for ways to utilize cannabis to keep you healthy, strong, and sharp, come join us every Wednesday where we dive into the best ways to use cannabis to optimize your life. Topics include cannabis and athletics, cannabis for productivity, cannabis for anxiety, cannabis for a healthy immune system, and so much more. If you're a curious connoisseur, this show is for you. So please head over to our page and we're looking forward to seeing you this week. Bye.